Greetings. My name is Heidi Kuhn. I'm founder and CEO of Roots of Peace, a humanitarian nonprofit dedicated to the eradication of landmines and the planting of sustainable peace worldwide. By turning minds to vines, we are dedicated towards building peace and digging deeper by planting the roots of peace worldwide. The subject uh, today of our discussion is uh, Mankind Wants Peace, but it has been hardly achieved, neither today nor in ancient times. Despite our sophisticated yep, yeah, so. governance systems, there is still much violence expressed by countries, regimes, and individuals. How does the pandemic affect the risk of violent conflict by peaceful means? As we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations this month, how may we leave a legacy for peace for the next generation when they celebrate the centennial in the next 25 years? I would like to welcome our very distinguished guests from around the world, His Excellency Ahmad Wali Massoud, Chairman of the Massoud Would Foundation of Afghanistan, Canon Cheryl Sarah Snyder, Archbishop of Canterbury's Advisor for Reconciliation, United Kingdom. Faisal bin Maunmar, Secretary General, Kaisi Dialogue Center, Saudi Arabia, and Sakai Holland, Chairperson of the Board of Trustees, Zimbabwe Peacebuilding Initiative, Zimbabwe. So as we begin our program today, we'd like to thank you all for joining us from around the world. And we'd like to thank the Harassis uh, Extraordinary Meeting for convening us as well as their partner with Run the World. And as we begin our dialogue, I would like to properly introduce our speaker. Each speaker will be speaking for two minutes and uh, followed by question and answers and closing remarks during the next 45 minutes. It is my great honor to introduce our first speaker, His Excellency Ahmad Wali Massoud, Chairman of the Massoud Foundation in Afghanistan and the youngest brother of the late Ahmad Shah Massoud, the Lion of Panjshir. Mr. Massoud obtained a degree in diplomatic studies from the University of Westminster, London in 1989. He has served as Afghanistan's ambassador to the United Kingdom, special representative of Ahmad Shah's Massoud in Europe, and representative of the Jamiat Party in London. He is founder of the Mount of Daily newspaper and the history of Yadahar, the memory of okay, what? Oh, Mr. Massoud published The National Agenda, a highly successful book acclaimed worldwide. It is now my great honor to introduce His Excellency Ahmad Wali Massoud. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me first, uh, I would like to send my regards to all the guests and the panels and yourself. And also, may I just thank everyone to participate in this very important dialogue here, and especially yourself that you took the initiative of such a dialogue, uh, which is uh, very important and vital for today's mankind. And uh, the dialogue in itself really brings all people from around the world to really talk about the very essential, very fundamental, very vital uh, value, which is peace something which has been lost for a long, long time. And uh, of course, what I can say from here from Afghanistan, as we all know that Afghanistan have not been at peace for a long, long time. It's almost uh, four decades Jim, that we have been at war. And let me say very frankly that even before that, since the creation of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Afghanistan have never enjoyed uh, harmony or a durable peace at all. And of course, may I just say that probably we are the victim of our geography. Our history is the victim of our geography. Probably we are the victim of our political culture. Probably we are the victim of our identities. Whatever the reason, but unfortunately, Afghanistan is one of the very long suffering country in the world, which have not been really seen in peace for a long time. Of course, from time to time, there has been some, part of, some sort of peace, but it was very short-lived. It was gone again and again. We lost that one. But of course, today, that Afghanistan once again is uh, under the focus of international community. We would like to really see this time that international community can make all the efforts 
to bring peace to Afghanistan because our problem is not only internal, it has different dimensions as well. It's internal as well as external. So in Afghanistan, while we are trying to bring peace here, while we are trying to bring some sort of balance inside different ethnicity in Afghanistan, we expect the international community to really kind of come into some sort of consensus about Afghanistan. We should not be anymore the victim of our history, of our geography. We should not be anymore the victim of our uh, uh, situation that way. We hope that uh, we can make it together with the world community. We hope that we can make a durable peace in Afghanistan, not a, just a populistic peace, not a political peace, not a somebody kind of probably a uh, kind of financial peace to make a project for peace and that's it finished. We hope that this time that the international community is focusing on Afghanistan. We really hope that we can do it Put together with the A situation we will never be gone back to the war. Thank you. Thank you so much for your very important remarks at this transitional moment in Afghanistan. And we will wish your country great success in the intra-Afghan peace talks. Our next is Canon Sarah Snyder, our Bishop of Canterbury Advisor for Reconciliation of the United Kingdom. And before I begin, if we could ask our panelists to please put yourself on mute if you're not speaking so that we can hear our panelists very clearly. Thank you. A theologian and mediator specializing in interreligious peace building, Canon Snyder brings wide ranging international experience in situations of violence and conflict. She has worked for many years to promote faith-based reconciliation and is founding director of the Rose Castle Foundation equipping the next generation of leaders to transform conflict within their spheres of influence. She also serves as Archbishop of Canterbury's Special Advisor for Reconciliation, supporting the Anglican <laughs> Church to be an agent of peace in conflict <laughs> and post-conflict <laughs> context. As former Director of the United Nations Partnerships at Religions for Peace, it is my great honor <laughs> to introduce Canon Sarah Schneider. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Greetings, Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Talk of peace often conjures up ideas of shared humanity, coexistence, tolerance, and agreement. Yet in reality, building peace means bringing together those who profoundly disagree, who have deeply wounded one another, people who are difficult, determined, and very different to ourselves, and who have no interest in becoming like us. The peace-building world can so easily fall into the trap of forming like-minded bubbles. Anyone willing to enter our welcoming space, to meet across multiple divides, to act together, is surely a potential ally. And there is nothing wrong with that. We need allies to bring about the changes we desire. However, we risk alienating the very people we need at our peace-building tables. Those who are suspicious of peace agendas, who see only compromise and threat to their deeply formed values and motivations. So what would it look like to open spaces in which these people feel welcome? If we are to succeed as builders of peace, we must be willing to step outside our comfortable bubbles, to sit with and listen to those who are very different, including those who understand who are unwilling to compromise on their worldviews and beliefs. And of course, listening to them does not mean we agree with them, but it does demonstrate our willingness to walk towards those with whom we disagree, to be willing to step into their shoes for a little while, experience the world through their eyes. Only then can we better understand the extent of our differences. Only then can we work out ways to collaborate across the deepest divides for the sake of sustainable peace in our wider community. Here at Rose Castle Foundation, we're particularly interested in welcoming just these kinds of communities to create and nurture spaces in which people who profoundly disagree feel able to meet. And I'd love to share with you multiple examples, but two minutes is short, so I can only say it is indeed possible and life-changing to convene conservative, with a small c, actors who have rarely met those on the other side of their metaphorical walls. Their very isolation means they have removed the human face of their enemy, creating instead their own image of the other, an image 
that becomes increasingly monstrous. Hence, it is easier to continue the viral of hurt and retaliation against them. Opening spaces in which such communities can meet face to face to rehumanize those they hate, to recognize the suffering of their so called offenders, begins to dismantle these walls of alienation. It opens a space in which they can reimagine small steps, often very tiny steps, towards collaborative action, not by agreeing with one another, but by a better quality of disagreement for the common good. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Sarah, for those very poignant remarks. It is now my great honor to introduce Sakai Holland, Chairman of the Board of Trustees Zimbabwe Peace Building Initiative, Zimbabwe. Senator Sakai Holland has dedicated her life to campaigning for human rights, democracy, and the empowerment of women. Her courageous and inspirational work was recognized in 2012 with the prestigious Sydney Peace Award, Australia's top honor. In the late 1960s, she was founder of Australia's anti-apartheid movement. As the former Zimbabwe co-minister of state for national healing and reconciliation and integration, Senator Holland worked alongside oh, uh, those yeah. responsible for her and torture. She focused on innovative strategies to better yeah. incorporate traditional Zimbabwean culture beliefs and practices to local, regional, and international best practices to help advance the healing process. She now serves as chairman of the board of the Zimbabwe okay. Peace Building Initiative. And it is my greatest honor to introduce uh, Senator Holland from Harare, Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. I would like to begin by going through my responses following what you gave us as guidelines. Mankind wants peace. I think that's an affirmative. And I want to salute uh, Dr. Frank Jugen Richter because this whole Horasis Global Visions community is a peace building activity. And um, I would like to also say we are watching today on October 1 a process of expression of peace by Dr. Frank Jugen Richter, by our being there with him. Um, this panel itself, all the people that are presenting are showing us a peace building activity in their country. And um, um, Canon uh, Sarah Snyder, after I attended her panel last year, I was able to match it here spiritually with something we will do together next year, this year. So next year, right. Uh, may I say that um, peace is our DNA. It's part of us. That's why people are seized with peace building all the time. In ancient times, the most beautiful annual event, peace on earth, um, is the Christmas message we hear from the ancient times. Um, I would like to just say here, uh, in Zimbabwe, the impact of COVID-19 has been to force our government for the president to actually come out of the closet because he's a peace builder and he is also somebody who is a listening president and the programs he has introduced for us and for civil society to link in with his work is becoming manifest each day these past few days. Um, Devolution is what his uh, program is called, and he has introduced the uh, two structures, the provincial development coordinators and the directors of local governance, which bring development to the people by the people with government in partnership. That's a very big peace builder, which COVID-19 has forced on us. There's been a lot of violence that has come up caused by our unpreparedness of dealing with the COVID-19. And these, the government has been forced to come out and bring real programs from the people because we are... I'm sorry, we've just lost Sakai for a moment. ...on we what we should be doing on the ground. 
Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sakai, for your beautiful remarks and uh, from the heart of Africa to the world. It is now my great honor to introduce His Excellency Faisal bin Munmar, Secretary General Kaisi Dialogue Center in Saudi Arabia. Faisal bin Muammar is the founding Secretary General of King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, the acronym KSEED, based in Vienna, Austria. His Excellency is also notable as the Supervisor General of King Abdulaziz Public Library based in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He earned a master's degree in management from West University and has been associated with the field of dialogue, culture, and education, pursuing the principles of coexistence by deepening knowledge and mutual understanding of diverse communities. It is now my great honor to introduce His Excellency Faisal bin Munmar. Assalamu alaikum. You can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, I say salam alaikum because you know uh, we do it as a Muslim almost uh, uh, hundred of times every day, and we do our prayer five times a day, and we have 1.8 billion Muslims face Mecca and Saudi Arabia uh, almost five times a day. So uh, we always think of peace. How? What, what is what is the definition of peace in our life? If you think of, about the humanity, 84% of the population of the world, they have a certain belief. And peace is almost in every dictionary of their life. So what is going wrong? You know, uh, as long as we are uh, all believers and we know that peace is part of our life and part of our daily life and our daily practice, and it should be a lifestyle. So we, we've been thinking, I've been in this business for the last uh, almost 25 years, building the national dialogue in Saudi Arabia and also the interreligious and intercultural dialogue, Kaisid in Vienna. We have uh, combined between uh, two groups who has never been combined in the peace buildings. That means we have a founding state, uh, policy makers, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Austria, Spain, and the Holy See. And we have on our board Muslims, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindus. So this combination of bringing, connecting religious leaders with policy makers, I think this is what's missing now in, uh, in, in uh, achieving peace. Uh, what we mean by peace is not only just uh, talking to uh, religious leaders or talking to uh, the public, but we want it to be uh, uh, a way of life. That means we have to really establish it in a way that everybody can believe that peace is good for humanity, and that's the only way to survive. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking about our activities in uh, Kaisid, we started uh, thinking uh, of how to implement initiatives around the world. Uh, we built uh, six platforms around the world, and through its program, we thought that uh, connecting religious leaders with policymakers is the shortest way to achieve peace. Uh, peace is really one of the uh, golden, uh, what you call it, wishes of everybody life. And uh, uh, thinking about what the humanity uh, f uh, facing now, the uh, uh, hidden enemy, the, the COVID-19, uh, we this is can be uh, our all all uh, all the world are trying to find the the, the solution or the, the the vaccine for that. But we have more uh, what you call it diseases uh, uh, more dangerous than the, the COVID-19. We have head, head speeches, we have extremism, we have also uh, things, uh, uh, terrorism, and uh, you know, all the uh, uh, things which is affecting the, the life of people everywhere. Uh, I can tell you from the experience of my brothers in Afghanistan, how uh, they were kidnapped by uh, criminals, and uh, the, 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 the life of Muslims and others who live in Afghanistan, it was turned uh, upside down. So this is what we uh, should think about it, how we can really uh, uh, not only talk about peace, but inject it in our blood, you know, 
to 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 you know when we go to the laboratory and do the blood tests, then we we see the world peace is there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wow, very very touching. Injecting peace in our blood as humanity. You know, as COVID nineteen has been the great equalizer, it has taken down borders across countries, and and we are one world. There, um, and it's the the seeds we have in common rather than which separate us. Um, it is um, my honor to introduce uh, Arslan uh, Sheikh How Howie, uh, the executive director of NSB Consulting Studies uh, from Algeria. He was on the line earlier, and our apologies uh, due to technical uh, challenges. Uh, he has bounced off, but when he does come on, I will properly introduce him. In the meantime, we're going to move on now to our question and answer and dialogue among one another. And I'd like to begin uh, with Your Excellency um, uh, Masood, uh, if you would be so kind. Um, I'd like to begin by a quote that um, you stated in 1998. You said, Afghans want to regain their right to self-determination through a democratic or traditional mechanism acceptable to our people. We are willing to move towards this noble goal. We consider this as part of our duty to defend humanity against the scourge of intolerance, violence, and fanaticism. Mr. Massoud, over 20 years later, do you feel this vision of peace may be realized during this window of time of the historic intra-Afghan peace talks? Uh, well, let me, in the part of Afghanistan, well, let me first say that I really learned a lot from the uh, participant in the panel, myself, in the part of Afghanistan, what we have done for the past 19 years, I have developed a national agenda in Afghanistan. In that one, I wrote a book about how exactly we can achieve peace in Afghanistan. And I put very straightforward that uh, we can have uh, different uh, stages so we can start that one. I said that we can start from uh, inter-Afghan dialogue. The Afghan must come and make a dialogue to see how exactly they can converge their ideas together. The second stage was how to really make a common vision for Afghanistan. That was very, very important for everybody here. The third stage was how to do the trust building in Afghanistan. The fourth was how to really kind of make a strong government. And then the fifth was how to really reach peace in Afghanistan. Now, we have been struggling for the past almost two decades here for the peace here. But unfortunately, what happened here Contrary to what we, what we envisage in Afghanistan, because the peace and war did not belong to us here inside Afghanistan. It really belongs to forces outside of our reach. We could not really kind of control. We did try, like me, many others tried very hard to see how exactly we can bring peace to this war shot of country. But unfortunately, because it was out of our control. We all know that, as I mentioned before, that our history has become the victim of our geography. We are in a situation that throughout the history of, of our uh, living, we have been uh, 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 kind of a field of our different rivalries, different powers really kind of, they did make their rivalries here. Without any regard to the people of Afghanistan here, we are still in that situation. It's not kind of, it's gone anymore. For the past 20 years, as I mentioned, peace, the war does not belong to us. We don't know who that financed the war, who is bringing these warmongers, who is really kind of making the violation, who is making the suicide bomb. We don't know because it's not in the capacity of the Afghans to make that one. Because once it comes from the corner of the world, we don't know who do. Now, as the peace initiative has started, we hope that we can possess our peace initiative. We hope that it should not be kind of on the, uh, on, on, on the representation of Afghans. Someone else should make the peace here. But what I really kind of suggest here the way that we have really invested peace in Afghanistan, we hope that uh, by your effort and by our friends' effort, we can make a dialogue as you started the dialogue itself. We can continue with this dialogue, especially if we can make Afghanistan as a model to, to, see, to see the convergence of all these efforts, to see how exactly we can make Afghanistan as a model, as a success model for peace. Because here, we have got different factors from outside and inside. Of course, we all know that what has really kind of torn apart the whole world is the identities, the religions, and also the economy, the money, and all of that. But then, if we really can think of, we are one creation of one God, different religion, but it's one God. We all believe in one God. 
How exactly we can really kind of feed and adapt this culture that we really the creation of one God? How we really can cope and make a harmony amongst ourselves from different uh, culture, different background, different religion? So we hope that we can do it here in South Afghanistan. I just don't want to take much of your time because we can go, we don't we don't want to go. Mm. Thank you. Your Excellency, that was such an inspirational thought. You know, Afghanistan is in the midst of a harvest of hope with an agricultural uh, uh, economy. And it is such a beautiful concept to think and imagine that, that Afghanistan could be a model for the world as we turn swords into plowshares. Thank you so much. I would like to now turn my next question to Canon uh, Sarah. Uh, the, the challenge of reconciliation is the part of efforts to end conflicts in many areas of the world. How do you recommend that we build bridges instead of walls? Uh, thank you uh, for that question. You know, um, the definition of reconciliation that I, I love to live with is this idea of healing what is broken, particularly broken relationships. Um, and if we are a little bit like fishermen, mending our nets every every single morning after a night's catch, we need to be working day by day by day by day at this journey of reconciliation. It's not a, a, a one-step um, journey, and it's actually usually a backwards and forwards, um, very challenging journey. We see huge um, steps backwards every time we take a little leap forward. But the idea of reconciliation, particularly for people with religious belief, is that first of all, we as a people, as a humanity, as in fact the whole creation need to be reconciled with God, uh, the creator. And then God in turn asks us to be reconciled as one with another. Uh, and indeed, I believe reconciled us with the earth. So this, this vision of reconciliation is a very uh, spiritual vision, if you like, um, in which we see God as the ultimate reconciler but we are able to be his hands and feet uh, on the ground. I think that what goes wrong in the process of reconciliation very often is the images that we build of those we dislike or that we don't trust or that we don't know. Um, and in building our own images, it's almost if you picture a wall, a metaphorical wall between myself and, and those on the other side of the divide in my community, that, that image goes up on my side of the wall. So I engage with my own image, which does, as I said in my little piece, become more and more monstrous because I don't ever meet the person on the other side. I don't see the suffering of the people on the other side. I don't understand uh, that they were victims in their own community. Uh, I'm not the only victim. Uh, all of us very often are actually victims. Different, different so there's a big process in reconciliation of rehumanizing that needs to happen and that i believe requires um listening very deeply to the stories of people across our divides and we're often very unwilling to listen to their stories uh, because we've already shut our ears before we've heard them. so deep listening is a core skill for reconciliation uh, and then the willingness to even look at the face of our enemy, uh, something that is very, very difficult for many people to do, uh, but that is important in that rehumanizing. Well, thank you for your comments. And what I'm hearing from both of you is um, that really uh, we are all daughters and sons of Abraham and whatever our path to the divine, we should respect that journey and, and use this window of time of this COVID-19 to, to dispel those stereotypes of one another and, and really get down on our knees uh, for what we are enduring and challenging as a world. And, and leading into that, Sakai, um, you have eloquently spoken about the importance of integrating sacred sites and science as you restore the lungs of Africa. Please explain the importance of integrating ancient beliefs with modern science. Okay. The first thing I should say is that um, um, we take humanity from science in the West. Scientists tell us in the West that life began in Africa, in fact, in East Africa. The word Tanganyika means the beginning of Earth. Tanganyika. So for us, the traditional name the traditional belief that life became where we are goes very well with the science that life began in Africa from a woman called Lucy, a man called Adam. Now, if you really believe that, 
Then you go on to step two, which is now we were offered this um, project to do in a peri-urban area around Harare. And uh, we ran there and uh, looked at what we could do with our women's clubs. When we got to the women's clubs to teach them skills training, so they become part of the digitalized um, population, um, which will then become, move them from the informal sector uh, into the small and medium formal sector where they become bankable. When we started doing that program, we found that the living space where they were in was in a wetland. And wetlands, in Shona belief, is that they are the places where the spirit mediums interact with our ancestors. So you cannot live in a wetland. So what we then did when we found that through our research was to link in with the Western people who study wetlands. And for sure, we found that science does conclude that wetlands are the lungs of the planet and that they have to be left to actually keep breathing. So what we have done since then is to now speak with government in different ministries. And that's where we find that our president is a listening president. He has got these two new structures that we are now linking into so that we do skills training to prepare people to move out of the illegal settlements where they are and we move with them to where they will have their new peace settlements and a new life. And where we will continue with them as they become digitalized for part of the digitalized population and into uh, the formal sector where they contribute to Zimbabwe's economy as a grassroots based society. Now, we go to do development in the Zimbabwe Peace Building Initiative through the woman in her home. And we use social mobilization of women doing their clubs, which started in Zimbabwe in 1938. And uh, we are resuscitating that methodology because the club becomes a very necessary missing social support system at the household and at the uh, community level. We've been very successful in getting these structures back in place. And basically, uh, these were the methods used in traditional society. Sisterhood is powerful. It's not just a Western thing. It's something that began in Africa because that's where women really depend on one another within the family structure to get their work done and the family kept together and the community running. So the traditional beliefs and the scientific beliefs, if you look deeply, it's not just about wetlands. It's about a whole lot of other things. Because I do believe myself that when you look at Western science and you look at the sperm and the egg hitting each other, they atomize and then they come together to build the person. I really believe that if we look at the science we are taught um, and our traditional beliefs, we will find that in all civilizations that have survived today, people really have peace building in their language, in their culture, and in their daily lives. It's embodied in that because it's our DNA. Our society in Shona and in Debele culture, it's a, when you marry, it's exogamous marriages because it's believed that as you marry outside the family, you strengthen the family network and roots and you get protection. So looking at our traditional beliefs with science always coincides because incest, we know, in Western society leads to the most devastating um, consequences to the genetic pool within the family. Um, we really believe ourselves in the Zimbabwe Peace Building Initiative and in the network that we need to understand why the culture was structured as it was.
Thank you. Thank you so much for that incredible insight. And, and just again, reminding us of the seeds we have in common rather than those which separate us. Um, I'd like to direct my next question to His Excellency Faisal bin Muammar. And um, you, uh, with Kaisi, your organization, are working with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Republic of Austria, the Kingdom of Spain, and the Holy See. How does your work enhance dialogue from intra-religious and societal backgrounds? Uh, thank you, Haile. I, uh, first of all, let me tell you that you are doing peace now by connecting us to with each other, you know, and I congratulate you. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to be with all the participants from different parts of the world. Uh, you know, when we start this, we started the intra-dialogue. I think it's very, very important and essential that uh, if you want to establish a, a true dialogue, you have to do it uh, within the religion itself. Uh, first. And then you go to other religion. But the concept we built is not only to build the bridges. We want to cross the bridges to the other side. And this, uh, this is really very important for us when we do the dialogue. But let me tell you my, from my own experience that I am coming from the world where we have extra dose of religion, what you call it. And from the other side, there is a, uh, uh, where I lived in uh, Vienna, there is extra dose of politics. So uh, when you try to bridge between the two, it is really not easy. It is very, very difficult sometimes. Uh, I remember talking to policymakers in the West about interreligious dialogue. So I started 2005 talking to some foreign ministries in Europe and in the West. It was really very, not very, uh, what do you call it, interesting subject for them to, to discuss because of the total separation between religion and the state. So we, we were to, trying to, to find the best way to connect religious leaders with policymakers. So in order to achieve peace around the world, I believe that we should build the bridges and cross the bridges to the other side and connect the two with each other. Without talking to each other, we are uh, creating a huge gap which can really lead to uh, the clash. We are trying to avoid the clash of civilization. And if we want to do it, we have to do it through dialogue. That's the only way we have to talk to each other. And not only talking to each other, the order we, we learned in our holy book, the Quran, is to say God created us to know each other. It's not to disconnect from each other. So how to know each other? It's not only by uh, so through the social media or through just uh, the media, and, uh, but through uh, with, uh, touch, uh, shaking hands with each other, although it's not allowed now during the COVID-19, but, you know, it's really very, very important for us to be connected to each other. And the other side is the misuse of religion. We shouldn't allow it, you know, when, when, for example, when we faced in Afghanistan and in Iraq and other parts of the world, the, the, the creation of terrorist organization, we should not really allow them to misuse religion or to associate themselves with religion. We, we should always uh, disconnect from them and we should always ask the media not to call them or to associate them with religion, certain religion. Uh, when they call it uh, the, the ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, I don't think it's the right uh, I, I, at all. They should, I, they should not do it. They should call them criminals, and that's the only way to, to deal with the criminals in every religion. You should, uh, religions, uh, religion and uh, religious leaders, they should also talk about it. You know, not to leave it to these criminals to uh, associate themselves with with with, uh, with, uh, with the religion itself. So I believe that we are doing the right thing. I learned from the others who presented their presentation. I think it's really fantastic to to be with them in this panel and to learn from their experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. And have we lost uh, His Excellency Masood? Is he on the line? I think we may have a little bit of a, a technical issue. Um, um, not to worry. Uh, 
Ken and Sarah, um, just as we, we do our closing remarks, I, I think, um, you know, how do we train a next generation of leaders equipped with faith-based mediation, uh, perhaps through a model of your Rose Castle Foundation or or linking those principles uh, with, with Faisal, uh, with Sakai, uh, uh, with Mr. Masood? You know, this is such a, a beautiful opportunity as we greet this month of October and um, celebration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, but what legacy can we leave behind for our children when 25 years from now, they will be celebrating the 100th anniversary? What is the message we leave yeah. for our children? Thank you. Um, there are so many uh, little tools that, that uh, we bring to train up um, younger reconcilers, most importantly, to understand reconciliation that's needed within themselves. So in other words, to understand that uh, they have grown up in a world that has taught them a whole lot of um, assumptions and stereotypes about those that they uh, don't trust. And, and we need to unpack some of that with them to help them understand uh, that to be leaders, they need to rise above some of the assumptions and the negative stereotypes that they have um, grown up with and to be able to encounter where that's appropriate, some of the people on the other side of their divides in order to be um, a reconciling leader. The other thing is that um, we really need to put them into situations where they can learn from their elders. Uh, we need much more intergenerational reconciliation. I sit at many peace building tables, which is a privilege, uh, but I wish um, that we were able to have more of the younger generation sitting around the outside, not just watching and listening, but actually being able to feed in some of the youth perspective on uh, on, on what their generation is looking for. So uh, I would I would advocate for far more of an elder um, and younger leader connecting wherever we are able to do that um, and, and a recognition of this inner journey of reconciliation that young people really need to go through in order to become resilient leaders in, in a world of conflict. Mm, thank you, Sarah, so much. Well, our time is coming to an end, and I would just like to thank the elders from around the world in sharing their their vast wisdom uh, from Saudi Arabia to Afghanistan uh, to Zimbabwe and to the United Kingdom. And of course, here from the United States of America, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to uh, Frank uh, Jürgen Richter for convening this truly uh, exemplary meeting. It is so timely and it's not just words uh, that we need to be saying and talking at one another. It is working with one another that we will truly plant the roots of peace on earth. And I would just like to conclude with generational wisdom um, in tribute to the United Nations. You know, across the street is the Isaiah Wall. And many global leaders go there for moments of reflection. It's a place where we can plant. We can look. We can plant a seed as we have for thousands of years. And with sunlight, water, and a human hand, that seed will grow. And regardless of the color of our hand, the faith in our heart, or the politics in our mind, as we remove these seeds of hatred and, and literally plant the roots of peace on earth, we are reminded of those words etched in stone at the Isaiah wall. And if I may repeat them, uh, they actually are reflective of, of all faiths in the Old Testament. I will conclude by saying, may they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, so that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you will continue to watch the other exciting panels on this historic day of October 1st, 2020. And thank you to the Harassus um, group and to the Run the World for hosting this virtual talk. Thank you so much, Tasha Kaur. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Well, still, we have a few seconds. Can I invite you all to visit our website, kaisi.org? Yes. You know, yes, yes, please. And, and thank yes. you, Heidi. Please. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you from Zimbabwe. Thank you from Afghanistan. I hope to see you soon, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. And let's say all of our websites. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, Sarah, what is your website, please? 
rosecastle.foundation. Please uh, actually come and visit the castle. It's 800 years old. It's very beautiful. And it's uh, near the English-Scottish border. So you're all very welcome. I, I, I will. I will. Excellent, excellent, and and Zimbabwe. Where? How? What is your website, please? Let's promote peace and through action, not just words. We are in the process of building one, and uh, what I'd say here is that uh, at the moment, you know, Zimbabwe is under fire for things that really are being fabricated most of the time. So what we are doing now is listening to the voices of the people. So we put up a website that gets inclusive and uh, embraces diversity. Well, we'll look, we'll look forward to that. We'll look forward to that. Yes. Thank you all so much. I will inform all of you now in the panel when we get that done. Excellent. And signing off from rootsofpeace.org. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Greetings. Bye-bye. So what, what we need to do